Well, the uh, Dow continues to creep along just under 20,000. Um, of course, it's the quiet time of year. So uh, this is not terribly uh, surprising. Um, but that said, it hasn't had such a sharp uptrend in, in many years. Uh, it's up 11% in, in the seven weeks uh, since the elections. And obviously, a continuation of uh, such a steep uptrend is highly unlikely. Um, it'll be interesting to see if it has uh, some sort of high volume reversal um, after it pierces the 20,000 level. Um, it did that in 1999, uh, March of 1999, when it went through uh, 10,000 for the first time. And it corrected uh, about 4.6% over the next few days. Uh, and it, uh, the news was that um, the concern was weaker corporate earnings. And of course that was, I think, pretty much used as an alibi because uh, that's what the news does. It has to find a reason for why the market moves in one direction or another. Um, and if, I've, uh, if, it, if it corrects on that level, um, for instance, 5% correction would bring it back to 19,000. But um, even with the steepening yield curve, um, which suggests a brighter economic uh, times on the horizon for 2017. Um, Trump does remain a wild card. Uh, some of his policies are indeed pro-market as reflected by uh, the action in some of these uh, industry groups. Uh, but he uh, also harbors uh, trade pro protectionist and isolationist policies uh, against countries such as China. And uh, that could backfire uh, because uh, the world uh, is moving increasingly towards uh, decentralization. And uh, many, many such business models which focus on this decentralization will eventually make dinosaurs out of existing models. Um, you could take any, 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 any group, um, you could take uh, education for instance, and unless you're going into something highly specialized, uh, higher education does put students in, in bigger and bigger debt, um, much more so than ever before. Um, and it teaches them to be cogs in an economy that doesn't want cogs anymore. Uh, you know, they talk about AI replacing some of these cogs. That's an inevit inevitability. Uh, that is right on the horizon. Um, the, the growth uh, of AI and uh, some of these other um, areas of technology is exponential. And uh, you can see how fast the world is changing now compared to the way it changed 20, 20 years ago. Um, and in fact, the AI, VR, and, and uh, what they call gamification um, are going to drive a revolution in education via online platforms. Um, so all that's to be said that the world is changing fast. Um, and uh, in this environment, uh, there are going to be certain companies that are going to greatly benefit from the changes. Um, and of course, profiting in the markets remains our focus. Um, if we look at uh, some of the names on our focus list right now, um, again, there you know, hasn't been a, much of a turbulent market since uh, the last webinar. If you look at think, something like AGX, it's pulled back uh, to its 10-day. Looks like it's trying to get some kind of traction there. Um, it's not doing anything particularly wrong. Uh, NVIDIA is uh, one that we put on many, many months ago, and that one, <laughs> that one just uh, doesn't stop. It's got a great business model and uh, went through the 100 level. Um, as Livermore talks about, if it can make it through the, through the century marks um, with con some conviction, then they usually continue higher. Um, and so far, this one is uh, right at the 108 level. Um, but that said, I mean, obviously, it's very extended up here. And so you would never be touching it at this level. Um, and also, it's on, a, on a price basis, it is pretty extended in terms of its pattern. You could argue, um, for instance, if you look at the weekly, you could argue that it, it's getting ahead of itself in terms of its price uh, action relative to um, the weeks that have led up to this. Um, and I, of course, I don't count the uh, viable gap up uh, that occurred in November, that obviously is going to make, make it look like it's really accelerating here. Um, but on a day-to-day -day basis, um, uh, yeah, you definitely don't want to be adding it here, but uh, you know, sit and uh, wait. Keep your stops tight because if we do get some sort of um, correction 
um, after the Dow hits 20,000. And that correction might only be for a couple days, uh, maybe a few days. But if we do, do get something on the order of a few percent, we all know what happens to stocks, uh, many stocks, um, when major averages correct just even 3, three or 4 percent. So you want to always keep your uh, stops uh, tight. Um, there's a couple stuff stocks on this list, um, MOS and SXC. These two names have, uh, they had some good moves earlier on and now um, they're backing and filling these, these types of names tend to trade in wide bands as we said. So uh, again, buying these things on weakness is generally a better prescription because so, then you keep your risk to a minimum. Um, what else uh, did I want? Oh yeah, there, there's a Chinese name on the list, JD, that really has had trouble getting going. Um, it's just lagging the markets and it is a Chinese name and Chinese names have not kept up with this market rally um, simply because of the concerns about uh, Trump's isolationist protectionist policies. So, um, you know, this one, if, you're, if you still own this, um, and you probably shouldn't, but if you do, uh, when it breaks, if it does break down through the low level of about 20, 25 and a quarter, um, you could have a lot of people putting stops at that level so it could cut through there like a, like a knife through butter. So this is one I, you know, I, if I wouldn't be sitting in the position um, right now, and it's also under some major, major resistance. I'd short it. Uh, yeah, exactly. I mean, and you have the benefit of, um, you know, when you see this kind of pattern set up, uh, it looks to me like it could, when it does drop, it's going to drop very quickly over a period of just, you know, minutes if there's a lot of stops that are, sell stops that are set up. Um, and it, yeah, your, your actual, um, your risk in shorting this thing is pretty limited because you have the convergence of three moving average lines um, just above where it's trading. Um, and yeah, with that, actually, do you, let, shall we uh, go into uh, talking about uh, some various uh, stocks? Um, I mean, yeah, I sure. mentioned a few off the list, but uh, you know, the the list hasn't grown um, because there's just uh, hasn't been much out there. It's interesting that you know, on a on a long or short thematic basis, uh, the markets have been pretty quiet. Yeah, I think all the hype over Dow 20,000 is basically keeping it from going through it. I'm, I'm actually surprised that, what was it, the other day, I think it came within 13 points of uh, Dow 20,000. I was surprised that they couldn't gas it right through that level. But if you guys remember what I was talking about last week, and something to watch out for, and I, I would say it's, it's mainly a theory right now, but one of the things that struck me is, it, is that they're sort of dangling Dow uh, 20,000 in front of investors and trying to bring, like, like they're trying to get, draw people into the market. And as we pointed out, both in the webinars recently and also uh, in one of our morning uh, Market Lab reports uh, earlier this week, it could be, institutions could be using this as a way to distribute stock. And you get everybody hyped up. You got the the Dow has come a long ways. I mean, you can see that on the chart right here, and it's come a long ways, bumping up against the twenty thousand level, and it's just dangling there. And of course, everybody in the media is excited. I, I think the media is probably more excited about it than anybody else. Uh, and but I think it does draw people into the market. You know, I get people asking me, "Oh, is there any stock?" I just talked to my accountant uh, a little while ago, going over the year end uh, tax numbers, or whatever. Uh, for estimates and whatnot, and uh, you know, he's asking me, do, do I get? I want to get into this market now. You know, what do I buy? What do I buy? And I'm like, I don't know, man. I, it's like you had to be. I, I think there were some things to buy earlier, but they were difficult to buy because they were all Trumpkin stocks. You know, you've seen oil stocks sort of stutter step and then roll over and just bouncing around and not really going anywhere. Some of these uh, stuff stocks, like the Mosaic, we were showing, and even some of the coals, like you know, Arch. Coal was looking pretty good, and, and but it's just not really getting any traction here. So the idea of, of being able to make any kind of big money here is, seems a little bit far-fetched, and probably nothing happens until we get into the new year. Now, that said, I, another thing I could see as a scenario is that they dangle this Dow 20,000 in front of everybody for a while, and so they're drawing people in, they're selling to them. If, if we operate on that assumption, okay, which just for the sake of argument I'm going to do, now, what they could do eventually is when they're done selling down to where they want to sell, then they let the Dow jack to 20,000, and then it fails at that point, similar to what the Dow did back in 99 when it went through uh, Dow 10,000 at that time. So, 
you know, that's one scenario. The other one is that we start a glorious new bull market that's going to be led by what? Stuff stocks. I mean, AGX is a nice name that's acting well, but, you know, the thing trades 223,000 shares a day. So not really what I would call a big, thick institutional stock. Are we going to have names like Martin Marietta lead? And I mean, that's a bigger sort of um, infrastructure materials name that might do okay here. And it's actually hanging in there all right. Uh, what else is there? You know, um, no, anybody notice Impinge rocking the other day? Now, that's a base breakout. Uh, but I think the spot to be buying it was you had this big pocket pivot move, and then you pulled into the 10-day line here. Now, notice something, again, for those of you who've been watching these webinars for a while, and you know what to look for on pullbacks. Notice here the volume dries up significantly on the pullback to the 10-day. That's actually a low-risk entry point. And then it pops out of there. Now you get the base breakout. It's a clean base breakout, but now it's pulling back in. So you don't really want to be buying the breakout. You might watch it come into the 10-day line. But, you know, this could, in my view, this is kind of extended here. I really wouldn't be chasing it. Um, and I would only, ha if I was going to buy this thing, I would have only bought it here. And that's it. And I'd be sitting, and if I was still in it, I'd be sitting waiting to see what happens. But I think this kind of move from here to here is something you would sell into. Uh, you know, if I look around for other names that, <coughs> excuse me, uh, we had this one on our list, Trade Desk, and we put it on last weekend, I believe, and it's been at the 10-day line. It's trying to, to break out. You can see that, but it's basically pulling into the 10-day line. Volume is light, so does this put it in a lower lower risk entry position here? Yeah, it does, and, but it's a thinner name. It trades 404,000 shares a day, so it's not really a what I would call a thick institutional quality leader. Now, now NVIDIA is, but, you know, and that's, I know uh, Stuart Varney over on Fox Business, he babbles on and on about Amazon being the stock of the year, but let's be real, the stock of the year is uh, NVIDIA, which has gone up, uh, well, how many times, Dr. Hay? Four times? Am I, uh, not quite four times. Like yeah, it's definitely, uh, that, it's the winning stock um, right. of and, this and year. And we actually put it on at 3580 on a pocket pivot report back in April. I think it was April 6th when the stock uh, closed at 3580 on April 6th. You can go back in the report archives and see that. And the stock's basically, if you look at this, I mean, this is almost textbook because if you look at it on the, the daily, once you bought it, if you wanted to give it room, you could just use the very simple uh, – eight-week rule of, uh, you know, selling it on a violation of the 10-day line, which it never has really had, but you could have just used the 50-day line once it really got up there as a, a guide for uh, support because it's never broken the 50-day line all the way up. Um, but I don't think, nah, did it really, I don't think it actually held the 10-day line after eight weeks. So you would have used the 50-day all, all along, right, Dr. K? Am I right there? Uh, right. Well, it's seven weeks. Uh, yeah, it has to. It has to obey the ten day, or basically, it's the ten day that it obeys for seven weeks, and then if it okay. after seven. it violates uh, after the seventh week, then you automatically. Uh, yeah, I don't think it did that because it kind of blew it below it here back in late June. So, yeah, so you would use a fifty day. So if you just done that, I mean, I guess you could have ridden this thing the whole way, and, but it's one out of you know a, a whole number of stocks that has acted well. And I remember people, you know, now I, I hear. One guy on uh, Twitter was telling me he thinks NVIDIA is the new Cisco, which I guess maybe it is, maybe it isn't. I, I don't know. You know, I, I can't tell you because I remember when Cisco was around and it came public in 91 and I was starting out as a broker. And, you know, after a year of Cisco running, nobody told told me that it was the first Cisco. So how you figure out that something is the next Cisco, I, I'm not really sure, but, you know, it sounds good. And I can remember that Acacia, when it was up here above the 100 level, it was the next Cisco, and if we look at this, you can see that way up here. Let me let me just show the pattern right there. I can remember getting emails. I don't know if you guys can see this very well. Let me make it bigger. But when the stock looked like this, I remember getting emails, and I get these emails all the time. Is uh, does Acacia qualify as a high tight flag? And uh, to me, a high tight flag is basically bunk. I know O'Neill talks about it in his books, but the, the first and only example he ever played was Syntax. And if you read the latest How to Make Money in Stocks book, they have like 15 examples, and over half of them are from the 60s or earlier. And then the other half are patterns that, to me, could be considered high-type flags. But if you study the patterns, you'll notice that there are a number of areas within the uptrend where you could have called something a high-type flag. So it, you know, to me, it's hindsight, and you can 
say that something is a high tight flag, but what does that really mean? Does that mean that, oh, just buy it, it's going to launch and go up 100% from here just because it, quote, qualifies as a high tight flag? Well, in my view, high tight flag is just is another label that's really not useful. Um, I prefer, you know, pocket pivots and roundabout pocket fit pivots and bottom fishing pocket pivots, undercut and rally setups, because those are all precise price or price volume action that becomes actionable at the point of impact rather than trying to slap a label on something and calling it a high tight flag and just buying it on that basis. Because if you did buy this on the basis of it being a high tight flag, so let's say these people who emailed me asking me if Acacia is a high tight flag and I said, oh yes it is, and just go in and mortgage your house and buy the stock, you know, well we know what happened since then. The thing has uh, basically gotten cut in half. So. You know, these patterns are great in hindsight, but I don't think they help you much in real time. And the better way to handle this would have perhaps been to operate on the basis of pocket pivots and using the 10-day and the 20-day line as a tight stop. Because if you had, you could have tested it here. There are several areas, I think. Yeah, you actually had no pocket pivots here. Here's one pocket pivot on the breakout, but it's a little extended. Let me show you right here. Uh, I think I'm going to use black. But you can see here it's it's breaking out on a pocket pivot uh, volume signature. Okay, so you know that's valid. But if you're going to buy it, I would definitely be using a tight stop at the top of this little teeny tiny flag thing, which is not even two weeks long, so it really doesn't qualify as a flag. But you know, by the time the stock is here, this is where the end of the tight, high tight flag that everybody was e emailing me about was forming. And I would point out also that if you're going to try and call something a high tight flag, you have to do it on the weekly chart. It's not on the daily chart. You know, four days of tight sideways action on a stock is not a, a high tight flag, much less anything more than a tiny bull flag. And that's about all you could call it if you wanted to put a label on it. But so, you know, I prefer things that are just more precise. And so you never really had any pocket pivots. You had one here, but and you could have tested that, okay, if you wanted to. But as soon as it failed here, you're gone. So your losses should be relatively well contained. Uh, and my, my view is if I buy a pocket pivot and it, it drops below, say, a moving average like the 10-day or the 20-day right after I buy it, I'm just gone immediately. It may cost me 4 or 5%. Usually, by that time, the stock has already started to look at me funny, and I'm going to sell it at that point. So, But, you know, just calling this a – go ahead, Dr. K. Were you saying something? The problem with uh, general labels like high tight flag – is that they are too general. Um, they're not specific enough. And so you can get pockets. If you look back through 50 years of market history, for instance, you can get periods. When I say periods, I mean maybe you get six months of high tight flags working in that general sense. Um, and that will lead people to mistakenly think it will continue to work. Uh, whereas in reality, you'll get year, you know, periods of years where that kind of pattern will end up costing you money. Uh, so. With, with these labels, you can get into trouble by um, over over generalizing, and I think that the, some of these labels, like that one, um, are guilty of that. Uh, so people have to really be watchful, mindful of um, just slapping a label on something. I know it's a um, it's a heuristic that simplifies the trading process, but it's it's a dangerous one because I think ultimately it will end up costing you money. So you know things things like uh, with the pocket pivots. For instance, back in 2005, 2006, um, the market was much more forgiving, especially late 2006, where it's just general buying on strength pocket pivots worked in abandon. They worked really well. Um, in fact, this sort of this sort of general label worked very well in the 80s and 90s too. But then um, post 2008, we have a QE market where the tone of the market changes, <clears throat> and while pocket pivots can st continue to work. In the last few years, <coughs> buying on strength doesn't work. Buying on weakness works very well. Um, and there is uh, that example that Gil pointed out earlier where you have um, a stock breaking out to new highs, but the time to buy it was after the pocket pivot on the constructive pullback back to its support. I think that was at the 10-day average. Yeah, that would have been inch that I was talking about. Yeah. yeah. And it could do that again. I mean, right now it's too extended, but let's say in the days ahead it uh, has another uh, fractal-like setup where it, it, it gently uh, pulls back to the 10-day or the 20-day on low volume, um, then you know, again, your risk is pretty limited. The chart obviously would still look pretty good that it wants to head higher, so you could maybe take a shot at it. Um, and obviously, you know, our, our style is not black box at all. We change with changing markets because the only thing that the market guarantees is that it will change. It doesn't stay static. It never has. 
Um, and uh, and that's, that's, a, that's guarantee that makes the markets interesting but also challenging to a lot of people um, who want more of a guarantee and a static basis or a static way of trading uh, you know, and end up paying you know, thousands of dollars for these um, you know, idiotic uh, software programs out there that you know, claim that they've, they've done so well. But uh, the problem with those, with those software packages is that um, there, there might be a couple out there that are legitimate that actually do make money over, over the cycles, but the problem is um, being able to stick with the system is, is really difficult. Hey, Dr. K. You yourself. Yeah. Here's a question, or someone makes a statement. I'm just interested to get your feedback on this. The statement is, AI, artificial intelligence, is no doubt working to replace us traders, if not to some extent already. Do you, would you agree with that statement? Yeah, absolutely. There's a, a lot of build-out in um, uh, machine learning uh, algos, uh, and I think that's going to also change the tone of the way markets are traded. Um, one thing that will probably well, I don't think will ever change, um, and that is uh, the, the trends in um, that we get. I, I don't see AI, the battle of AI, you know, AI wars in, in the trading arena um, becoming so efficient that that we don't get trends anymore. Uh, so I, I think that <clears throat> I think it'll be interesting because I mean, with all these AI AI buildouts that will be occurring, it's still going to be you know a matter of um, exploiting inefficiencies. I mean, that's what it's all about. And I don't think you, I can't envision a world where everything, all these trading systems are so efficient that there's, that there's no more inefficiencies in the market. You know, that, that presumes a, uh, a perfect um, equilibrium of, uh, of, of human beings and these AI machine learning uh, algorithms. Um, I, I think if that did happen, I think we're probably at least a a couple generations away from that kind of equilibrium. So right now, at least within the next, you know, five to ten years, uh, there, there will still be inefficiencies that can be exploited. Um, and just like with this, uh, you know, the, this nano trading that, that uh, you know, was prevalent or has been prevalent for many years now, um, it hasn't, uh, well, it's changed the way markets trade, certainly. You know, it's just like when we went from uh, fractions to decimalization, that that also dried up liquidity for a lot of market makers. So instead of being able to buy, uh, say, back in back in the 90s, you could easily buy 10% of a daily trade of a stock. Say a Nasdaq stock traded uh, 500,000 shares a day. You could pick up 50,000 without moving the price much because it was very liquid. And then we, when we when we decimalized, um, try doing that with, uh, I mean, 10%. Forget about 10%. More like 1%. You know, unless otherwise your slippage is too great. So. The idea here is always be aware of, of material changes in the market and adjust accordingly. And uh, you know, the last few years obviously have been more challenging than, say, the 1990s. But nevertheless, um, there have been windows of opportunity, um, and uh, there have been other ways, uh, such as through volatility, to to capitalize on on profits in the market. So. All that's to say, there will, I think there will always be ways to make money. It's just a matter of keeping ahead of that curve. And uh, that means there are no get-rich-quick schemes or, or you know, black box methods that will, will ever work uh, for the long run. Yeah, personally, I don't really care if it's AI. Who the, who's on the other side of my trades doesn't really phase me. It's all whoever's on the other side of my trades. And if there is AI out there operating now, it certainly doesn't keep me from making money for what is now my fourth year in a row in the markets, which I've never done before. Actually, three years in a row I'd never done before until last year. So, I, you know, if they're out there, they're out there, but I don't think I'm going to be having one. I won't be having a robot running my, my uh, account anytime soon. So, but they're out there, and I'm sure, like you're saying, Dr. K, that's going to continue to expand, I and mean, we'll see where it goes. I mean, you know, can, can you get a C3PO trading your account? I don't know. I guess we'll find out, huh? <laughs> Okay, what else are we looking at here? Um, <clears throat> I did want to point out, we were talking about NVIDIA. Once, you know, anybody knows uh, Jesse Livermore's uh, century mark rule in reverse. Basically, once it clears the 100 mark, so it did that uh, last week, and we talked about this uh a couple of weeks ago over the weekend, that once it does it, you can try and buy the stock using the 100 level as a stop. Now, if you had done it here, that would have 
failed for a brief period of time uh, a couple three weeks ago but then the second push through it would have worked so you could have bought it on the on the move above the hundred level and now you'd be up about eight. what's that that that's a five level pardon me that was a 95 well, I'm level. sorry I'm sorry what am I saying I'm, I'm looking at this all wrong my, my mistake no you had uh, well, actually when it cleared uh, it happened on Monday so that was when it actually cleared for here you had a failure uh, it got just above it on I, I guess that was two Thursdays ago and then it, it sort of came back in so it failed temporarily but then you finally were able to clear it uh, over the next couple of days and once it did you could have bought it but you could have bought it anywhere in there and used like one or two percent porosity if you wanted to play it that way so now it just keeps going but like Dr. K said it is extended I would look for you know maybe 10 15 percent of upside from here maybe uh, maybe you can get that I don't know and then maybe maybe it tops, but I, I you know I'm not so sure about people jumping into the stock now with the idea that it's the next Cisco or the next anything. So in fact, I don't think anybody knows when anything is the next anything because they don't tell you when something is the first something. But you know whatever, it, it makes for great cocktail conversation, I guess. But um, in any case, uh, so so you know you look around here, I, I see some names that to me look like possible shorts. This is a Potentially, look at this light has had a decent upside move for since coming public. When was it? Last year? Yeah, last year. And now it's kind of getting. Notice how the pattern's getting a little bit loose here, and you're sort of tightening up along the 10 and 20 day line. I don't know if this thing resolves to the upside or the downside, but what I would definitely be watching for is some potential breakdown here, because it looks to me like it wants to break. Dr. K, if you're looking at this chart, where would you say this is likely to head from here? Lower or higher? Well, it's 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 very you know it's kind of neutral right now. I I would be looking at a breakdown or a break up. I mean it's trading right around resistance. I mean through through resistance and support. Yeah. Uh, you know and and I mean overall if you look it had a gap down and then you had big volume to the downside and then you you know there's a lot of red spikes in the pattern. So I would guess that the next the next move is going to be lower, not not higher. The base is defective. Yeah, you would think so, but I guess we'll find out, won't we? Um, another one that's in the similar group is Finisar, looking like it wants to fail. Um, and that, I actually shorted that yesterday, and it came in a little bit. Now, it looks like it might want to bust. If it does bust the 50-day uh, line, that would confirm it as a uh, failed breakout attempt here, but that looks like it might be shortable. Um, and then you have, uh, but you know, in the same group, which is kind of odd, you have Sienna's acting pretty well, and that's similar to Finisar, and Finisar has better estimates going forward, uh, and Juniper Networks is acting well, and so these these names seem to be acting well, while names like Light and, uh, and Finisar seem to flounder about a little bit. Another one is uh, Fabernet, which looks similar. You notice how they're all similar looking, and this looks like uh, like it wants to break down. You know, in the old days, if I looked at something like this, I would say, oh, this thing's going to gonna bust what, split wide open because of all the selling and the stalling and the churning and the wide volatility. But sometimes in this market, these things just set up and go higher. So someone's asking about Twilio. Twilio had some news the other day that they're expanding their relationship with uh, Amazon. And so what you had happen there was a big two-day pump to the upside. And yesterday it reversed on about the same volume as you had on Wednesday and now it's kind of floundering so you know it's hard for me to say what this thing's going to do from here but it looks like uh, it's just kind of flopping around and trying to form a low so but but again you know this is another interesting one now that you bring it up because I remember right there you know I was getting a lot of stuff about it's just a high tight flag and I guess if you had bought it you would have been happy for a little while because it broke out but then it just failed miserably so again you know, I can cherry pick examples of these patterns at work and then tell you that a high tight flag is a wonderful pattern and all you have to do is buy it and you'll make hundreds of percent right away. That's all a bunch of baloney. And I can tell you right off the bat that a lot of that stuff that you read in How to Make Money in Stocks is all cherry pick stuff. And so in terms of the precise action of a stock, I would rather be focusing on pivot, uh, pocket pivots and other buy points rather than trying to label something a high tight flag or a, a low loose uh, pennant or whatever the hell you want to call it. 
rather than this, these cherry-picked patterns. And, and I, I notice that they suck people into getting all excited about these things. Like they want to, oh, I want to, you know, they want it to be a high type flag because that means it's going to go up like mad and they're going to make tons of money. And then they end up getting hammered if they're not exercising any uh, prudent risk management. But for the most part, um, I think that a lot of that stuff is cherry pick. I mean, we, were, we even talked about it before in the model book studies that, it, you know, I always thought that if you wanted to determine what the driving characteristics were of leading stocks, you would look at, you know, if there's 150 stocks that had 100% or 200% move, then you would look at all those stocks and then determine the common characteristics that they had. That's how I thought it would work. But I, when I was at O'Neill, I realized what happens is we would give Bill, and you remember this, Dr. K, you give Bill, uh, you know, 100 charts of stocks that had big moves, and he'd immediately pull out 70 of them and throw them out because they didn't fit what he thought they should be. Yeah, so, that, you know, I headed up the 1998 model book project, and that was, uh, um, it, it was kind of like pulling teeth with him sometimes because, you know, I, I came up with a what I, I felt were very fair lists, um, and then he right. would go and you know, execute a number of names. I mean, sometimes he had legitimate reasons, as in sometimes they were too thin. Okay, so let's just kind of, if they're micro caps, let's not include them because they're too erratic. But other times, uh, it seems like he had brought his own internal biases um, to the table. And, uh, you know, I noticed in studying all the model books before that, that uh, they carried the same flaws. Now, that said, they're still useful. I used them anyway because uh, what I noticed was I was able to look at um, the fundamentals, the fundamental story behind model book stocks, the ones that, that have been picked, you know, and, and they do, you know, it, it underscored the, uh, the importance of understanding the playing field the fun, in terms of what, what companies are going to be the next Ebays, Amazons, Yahoo's, Googles, etc. Uh, so, I mean, in the, in the late 90s, a big part of my success was um, obviously due to the technical action in stocks, but um, the other part was the fundamentals um, in understanding what will separate an Amazon and eBay from, you know, say uh, a UBIT, if anyone remembers that one, um, that was a competitor to eBay, you know, and you had a lot of these follow-on competitors, uh, but they were second rate. And to understand uh, that the fundamentals are the driving force, um, it, it make all the, they make all the difference between say, the UBIT, for instance, that, that was IPO'd and that went up, I think, you know, 200 some percent in like three days. Uh, I played that one because I could see that that was the market's uh, psychology is to drive these things a hell of a lot higher. But eBay was the one that's going to sustain and of course here it is today. You know, still, still going strong. It is still the leader in its space. Um, so that's, that's a very important lesson that I took with me in, um, in spearheading that project. You know, so, but in terms of people, you know, doing their own model book studies, you know, just be aware of your own internal biases um, because that will distort your results if you're not aware, at least at least be aware of it so you, you know how to compensate for for such biases. Right. And, uh, and, and you know, all this is to say that be careful about a lot of these labeled patterns and just relying on simple stuff like that. I, I'd say be more specific in terms of the precise uh, price volume action rather than relying on some sort of uh, blanket coverage. So someone's saying uh, in, insight looks like it's coiling uh, I guess it is, but it doesn't seem to want to go anywhere. It gets hit by volume whenever it tries to break out, and it looks like that on the weekly chart. So I don't know about what coiling means, because coiling is generally if you're getting really tight and you're seeing volume decline, and, okay, volume's declining over the last couple of days, that that's probably due to the holiday season. And if you look at this, you can see there's a pocket pivot here. I believe it's, it would be this day right here which clears the 10-day uh, line, but then the stock blows over on heavy selling volume, and then you get hit with some heavy selling volume off the peak here. So I, I don't know if that's really coiling to me, but I wouldn't be buying a stock on the basis of some perception that it's coiling or whatever it's doing. Uh, but it's just a pattern in a base, and that's about all. I don't know if there's anything I'd look at as being viable. Are there, does this thing have great earnings or something, Dr. K? Well, the earnings are there. Yeah, the, it's got tremendous earnings acceleration, oh. um, and the estimates are are, are triple digit uh, into 2017, um, into the end of it because uh, its fiscal year ends on December, um, and the uh, the sales on this thing are still very strong. 
so yeah, fundamentally it looks great, but on a technical basis, um, you're you're reading a bit in, into the chart. If you look at the weekly, it it tends to has wide ranges. It's it's just, uh, I don't really see quite, coiling. Really tight. Um, but again, tight that's just a label, you know. To say something is coiling, what what does that mean exactly? You know, right? Yeah, no, exa exactly. Um, I, you gotta just look at the context. Context is everything. And what I like about weeklies is that it shows that this name has kind of traded in this manner uh, for the last couple of years. Um, actually, the last just about the last two and a half years, it tends to be kind of a wide banding, a bit sloppy trader. Um, so it's not right now. It's not tight enough on a weekly for me to step in and get excited about this name. I love the fundamentals. Uh, if, you know, it's looking good, and uh, my guess is that uh, it could very well uh, become more constructive in in its price volume action, and, and then uh, maybe I'll get interested at that point. Hey, Dr. I could reach you. Know, does the, uh, do we close early today? today? Sorry. Do we close early today, or is it a normal day? No. Uh, normal day. No, no early closes uh, until. Yeah, that's because Christmas is on Sunday. Okay, just wanted to make yeah. sure on that. No uh, let's see. Um, but yeah, I mean, 2013. This this insight that that was. Uh, but it, you know, you'll notice it had a different character to its price volume action. It was very clean, you know. And that you could call some of those sideways moves. You know, I, I guess if you want to use the label coiling, uh, you could say that because it was uh, pretty clean and tight um, for a few weeks in there, and then it would advance. And uh, you know, did that for about uh, well, did that for several months. Um, but since uh, since basically late 2014, uh, this stock has taken on a different trading character, and so far there's no evidence that it's changed the character. Yeah, it almost looks like a big pod with a handle. So I don't know. I'm not going to buy it. Uh, let's see. Hmm. I mean, you know, looking around, it's it's really hard. To, to say, you know, with any any uh, conviction that you need to be long this or long that. And I, and I would tend to, like, lay low until probably New Year's and see what happens. If we get a big sell-off next week, I guess that's a possibility. But it, I would think that they might try and push the market to 20000 on the Dow. And then, then I guess we'll see what happens after that. But um, I just don't, you know... I, one of the things about the market that I think is important to remember is that sometimes it's more important to what you don't do as opposed to what you do. So in a situation like this where you have the Dow pushing up against 20,000, it's already up. What were you saying, 8 or 9 percent? I was calculating the other day 11 percent off the low before the election, but maybe I'm wrong. So um, from, the, from the close, um, yeah. it's up 11.3 percent. Yeah, okay. So that's what I calculated. Um, so, you know, it's up. That, that's, you know, a lot of people are talking about, oh, and then Dow's going to break 20,000, the train's leaving the station. Well, if you look at this chart, it looks to me like the train already left the station way back here in early November, and maybe Dow 20,000 isn't so much a station that it's leaving from as it is its destination or, or arrival point. That's what it looks like to me. But, you know, I don't know. It, to me, it's just a number, and like I said, it could be used by institutions to dangle in front of investors and distribute stock to them because the bottom line is interest rates are going up and it doesn't seem like the Fed is backing down on that. I mean, in fact, Janet Yellen, I guess on Monday was talking to some college students and basically taking a victory lap because we're now at maximum employment. So I, I'm not, not sure what, she, what planet she lives on, but uh, I guess she's not understanding that you have 60, I, I believe it's over 65 million people now have left the labor force the most in 75 years. So with that many people out of the labor force, how can you say that we're at maximum employment? And when the jobs numbers each month come in under 200,000 and you need at least 250,000 jobs per month uh, to be created in order to just keep up with the population change, you're falling behind. And so I don't know where they get all this from, but you know, I guess now that Trump is in and Obama is in, maybe they are political and they don't care if they tank the market. Or they see something coming down the pipe and they need uh, some some uh, leverage in terms of monetary policy to, to uh, deal with the crisis if that occurs. Because obviously if you're at zero interest rates and something happens, you've got nowhere to go. And we've already shown or seen rather that negative interest rates don't work. Anyways, let me go through some more names. I'm just going to fly through some stuff. We've got about 20 minutes left. 
Caterpillar, I was thinking, might be a short, but notice how it's holding along the 20-day line. If this thing can launch from here, then they'll, it'll help get to Dow uh, 20,000. So uh, let's look at uh, some of the airlines. I've talked about this. Here's Delta Airlines breaking down to the 20-day line. Now this, like I've shown you before, is like a big pot, okay? Now you could say it's consolidating normally so far along the peak here, and, and that could be true, but I'd be watching for a breach of the 20-day line uh, on the downside as a confirmation of a potential uh, pod failure, okay? I'd watch Netflix, which is acting well, uh, not acting badly, but if it does breach here on the 20-day, that could send it into uh, a pod failure land because it's kind of a pod-like, not really so much a pod as it is a big, ugly cup with handle. And notice how this is sort of stalling on the left side as we come up uh, here. You can see a little bit of this over the last three weeks, and you're near, near these highs, so... You know, it could pull in and break down. So I, I'd be watching that. Uh, so I'm seeing, you know, a number of things that I could construe as possible short sale targets if I want to. Uh, and at the same time, I'm not seeing a lot that really gets me excited on the long side. Let's look at Qualcomm as another one. Notice how it broke the 50-day line last week. And, of course, this one's been trying to... Uh, just drive us batty by breaking down and then rallying and then breaking down. And now yesterday you had a reversal at the 50-day line. And this to me looks like a short using the 50-day uh, line as a tight stop, which I think is at what, 67.31? Uh, so you hit a high uh, yesterday, 67.75. But to me that looked like a short at that point. So, And uh, you look at something like... Uh, these defense names. This, these are starting to look possible, like possible shorts. Northrop Grumman. These things have gapped down. I think I show, showed them uh, yeah, last week. They gapped down below the 50-day, hanging underneath the 50-day. Maybe they roll over. So that's something to keep an eye out uh, for. Um, now has actually. That's been one we've talked about. Notice how it's back to the 200-day line. So it's short. It was shortable on bounces. So that's what you're looking for in some of these names. But, you know, I'd watch for a uh, you know, name like Grub, possibly, I think, may break down. You, if you look at the weekly pattern, you're seeing a head and shoulders type formation here. Uh, it looks like this. Boom, boom. Rolling, rolling like that. And now we're kind of reversing here. And that looks like it could be vulnerable to uh, further downside. So, and it's had a big move off the lows. And that, you know, this, this one in this case would be something I'd look to short uh, in here and using the 50-day or on any bump back up to the 50-day at 38.18. I mean, it, technically it's within shortable range here, so I guess you could get excited about it here if you wanted to, but uh, I'd look for some kind of a rally maybe next week or just see what things look like at the beginning of the year. Um, some of these oils have broken out and now they're kind of in failure land. Like you look at Continental Resources, this thing broke out on the o OPEC news and of course you had a rally uh, in here last week on the news that the uh, non-OPEC members were going to cut production as well and uh, gapped up and it reversed hard. Now it's actually failed through the breakout point and it's sitting between the 20-day and the 50-day moving average, which makes me wonder whether this thing's going to fail. And so that's something I'd be uh, watching out for. I think that if the econ you know, if you look at a lot of the economic numbers right now, you're, you're actually, like, like holiday sales are down 4%. Uh, you're seeing a lot of other numbers showing that there is some underlying weakness in the economy. And so on that basis, unless Trump can really turn things around right away, you could be looking at an economic slowdown in the U.S. that's continuing. In addition, you have the, the Eurobank crisis with the oldest bank in the world. Uh, what's the name of the bank in Italy, Dr. K? Do you know that one that's yeah, there? It's the oldest one. I don't remember the name, but it but is there. But the they're bank. having tr trouble, and that could cause a crisis in Europe. They're probably get, they're, they just announced that they weren't able to raise capital from investors, so now they're going to have to get a bailout. And then you have the debt bubble in China. And you're seeing money flow out of China. You know, China's actually had to limit the amount of capital or, or, or you know, capital and, and currency flowing out of the uh, out of the country and that's not necessarily a good sign what's, for what's interesting um, is that that yeah that the Chinese government's trying to intervene but here's where governments always fall short they don't understand technology or the cutting edge let's right. say and um, I, I have 
I, I know of people um, and, and, and friends of some of these people who are very well money. They're sitting in China and um, through you know very closed discussion, they you know they're they're it's very clear um, that they're funneling a lot of their capital via Bitcoin um, out of the country. Very simple, very easy to do. <clears throat> these people are very uh, well heeled and te technocentric. So, <clears throat> or at least if they're not technocentric, they get you know, people who are. And you know China <clears throat> has been. Um, very much on board Bitcoin, regardless of what the news has said since 2012, 2013. Um, and uh, what that money is going to do is ultimately it's, it boosts real estate. Um, that's a great way to park your capital, especially if you're sitting on a few billion. And um, uh, that, that obviously changes the world dynamics. And these are things you don't read about in the headlines, but you, anyone who is aware of uh, people who are highly successful in China um, that are sitting on a ton of capital, there's ways to get it out, and Bitcoin pretty much is, is the go-to way uh, to get it safely out of the country. I, I think right now the Chinese government has imposed a 50, the equivalent of $50,000 um, maximum that anyone can take out of the country, which is a joke, um, especially if you want to get out you know, millions to, to, or, or a lot more than that. Um, and that's another reason Bitcoin has hit new highs recently. Um, you know, it's, the valuation of these cryptocurrencies is based on their, their functionality. And that's certainly a viable and important function of uh, Bitcoin to be able to, to move money um, in the way it's being moved out of China. And it's not just China, it's going to be uh, Russia, it's going to be India, you know, there'll be, there'll be a lot of follow-on countries because there's a lot of newly minted uh, money that, uh, or let's say newly, newly minted wealth um, that's been created in those countries that are going to have to find a way um, out of the country, uh, so you know, simply because uh, you know these people don't want to have all their eggs in one basket, they want to be diversified. Uh, okay, we're, we're, you kind of went off on a tangent there, but I guess my my point is that with China is looking weak. You look at the FXI breaking down; these are all catalysts for a potential market pullback. And also, if if we get a weakening economy, I don't necessarily think that's good for oil stocks. So in this case, I'd watch some of these to see if they start to fail. I was noticing Fang was getting hit the other day pretty good. Uh, but I noticed that the Dow names are acting okay. Exxon and Chevron, or I'm sorry, CVX, that's the a, that's a symbol. And they're hanging in there, which I think is interesting. Um, but in any case, I think they're, you got to watch some of these oils because they could fail. And a lot of them, if you look at the patterns, uh, they, they've actually had big moves and some of them are in sort of pod-like positions where they're near old highs and so it, it's possible this could become an area where uh, you can be shorting things. Somebody's saying Merry yeah, Christmas. You know. uh, yeah, Merry Christmas back at you. It's now, Christmas is now legal, I understand, uh, once again, now that Trump is president, which I guess is nice, but um, I thought it was hilarious. I saw some college students protesting that they wanted a safe zone from Christmas. It's like what? You can actually, wrong you can actually with these say Merry people? Christmas safely once again in schools without getting your getting uh, suspended. Like, what they don't understand is that college is a safe zone. Go out into the real world and try paying some bills, you morons. It's like I, I, I don't know. This all is baloney gets I think it's just gotten out of hand. Hopefully some of it will end, but it's just ludicrous. Anyways, uh yeah, I INS, Ions the issue is is still there. It has another one of your Everyone. cheesy pharmaceuticals can, tweet can you hear it. Uh, it's I am pharmaceutical. Is that a turn? I don't know if that's a turn. I mean, what do you mean? It, meaning what? It's turned off the lows, but what does that mean? I'm going to load into it here because I can say it's a turn. I don't know. It's just probably got some news, and uh, tomorrow it'll blow up after there's something that comes. I don't know. I'm not going to buy that up here, anyways. Um, yeah, I wanted to say. Um, can you hear me all right? I hear you. Yeah, uh, the Chinese issue. The you know it hasn't gone away. It was only last year that. The markets had very dramatic corrections as a result of uh, Chinese slowdown in the economy. Uh, there's still bubbles out there in China that have not deflated one bit. And, and so, you know, if we get another piece of news out of China that's quite negative, um, that's going to take down markets. And ultimately, the price of oil will, will be affected because uh, if the Chinese economy isn't as sanguine as people want to believe, um, that's going to influence the demand on uh, a whole wide basket of commodities. Right. And right now, you know, a lot of these commodity-based names have started to falter a little bit. Um, you got the metals also 
hanging in there. Uh, here's one, STLDs. Eh, but, you know, a lot of these look like they could start to roll over. Uh, Freeport, that rolled over. Southern Copper, that looks like it's rolling over. And these are all looking good a week or so ago. Rio is rolling over. So who knows? I mean, I, this is, uh, like I said, it's just not, I don't see anything definitive that I'm going to jump all over right here and get heavy inv heavily invested one way or the other. Uh, I see some things developing, percolating. I, I don't, we'll see, I think, when January rolls around. But other than that, it's, it's very tough to find anything that is terribly actionable. Uh, you know, outside of NVIDIA earlier this week coming up to the 100 level, that would have worked. But other than that, you know, the PI you have to buy when it's looking uh, weak, not when it's sticking straight up in the air. But what else is there beyond that? You know, you've got Square has been acting well, but now it's hanging around its 10-day line. It probably needs to go sideways for a while, and it probably will ahead of earnings, I think, in January or February, whenever that is. But, you know, just not a lot to get excited about. So what do you do when you don't have anything to get excited about? Find something else to get excited about. Like uh, you could do Christmas shopping or Hanukkah shopping. I think when Hanukkah is in full force right now. Any, any Hanukkah celebrators out there? No? Um, somebody goes, what do you think about shorting bonds? Uh, I don't know. Shorting bonds or shorting the TLT? Would that mean meaning you buy the TBT? Uh that assumes that uh, that they're going to go lower. I don't know. I, I, you could find that that uh, interest rates, the, the Fed really can't lower rates. What if we see a big crisis out of China or in Europe? Can the Fed start keep lowering rates, and will we see bonds maybe get a, a fear bid uh, in them? Maybe you see gold and silver, the same thing happens there. I don't know. So, I, you know, I think if you were going to short bonds, the time to short bonds would have been on the gap down here. So I don't know. I think it's risky here. And, I, you know, that's sort of a seat of the pants kind of trade. What do you think about shorting bonds here? It's like, I, do you see a basis for shorting them here? Is risk higher to the upside or the downside? I, you know, just look at the pattern. It doesn't strike me as something that is ripe for uh, for shorting, you know. So anyways, uh, what else? What else? Hanukkah, yes, not a big deal holiday now. Yeah, it's pretty mellow. I, I mean, I had, growing up, uh, I grew up in East L.A., and there actually it's a large Jewish contingent. One of my best friends was a kid named Glenn Goldman, not from Goldman Sachs, but uh, I used to go over his house on Hanukkah, and I actually thought he was lucky because he got eight days of presents, and we only got one. But he we used to think I was lucky because we had lights and Christmas trees, so, you know, we agreed to, we would trade. Anyways, um, okay. Somebody says, I didn't know uh, Jackie was Jewish, Scott. That's interesting. That's good. Celebrate both. Celebrate all of them. You know, and then there's Kwanzaa, I think, is on the 26th, and I'm all for that. I mean, remember, Thanksgiving wasn't declared a holiday, I think, until Roosevelt declared it in the 1940s. So holidays are good things. Celebrate uh, early and often, I say. Anyways, and that goes for all of them. Uh and I, I wish people would embrace that concept more than excluding holidays, you know. Because uh, I, I actually s uh, successfully boycotted my kids' uh, high school. Uh, they call it the winter program. It's like it's a musical thing they do every December before Christmas, but there isn't a mention of Christmas in it at all. So I just boycott it. Anyways, uh, what other names are looking at? You know what? A name that looks interesting to me possibly might be this one. Although this is crazy. It's a, it's a great uh, story. And the weekly pattern, you do see some supporting action on the weekly bars. And it's just kind of hanging around the 50-day. But that's one I've been keeping my eye on. Uh, what else has looked good here? I thought this was interesting. I'm going to run some of these. Nutanix looked like it was going to rock the other day. It had this big... Uh, Get a better view of it there. This sort of pocket pivot coming through the 20-day. It's it's hanging tight. I don't know if it's going to try and hold. I guess if we get into a good market next year, then some of these things you could probably look at as potentially viable. The PI, you know, even NTNX uh, maybe would set up again. Twilio maybe it sets up again someday. But this doesn't look too good, and it doesn't look ready yet. And that's a pattern on a weekly chart. And that almost, if you look at it, it looks like a massive head and shoulders. <laughs> you guys see that? Squint a little bit. It's easier to see if you have some eggnog. Uh, and then, so there's that's what I'm looking at. So it almost looks like it could go lower. So assuming that this is you know going to 
bottom and turn around. I don't know. It's a stretch. And it, is any, does anybody see anything out there that they feel a huge amount of conviction about on the long side? That you just have to own this thing here and buy it here and load the boat? Uh, anything? Anybody? No, nobody. So, nothing from anybody. No, see? I mean, and that's kind of what you're seeing. So, again, it gets back to this whole idea of and sometimes in the market it's in, what's important is not what you do but what you don't do, you know, and you just end up, you try doing something you end up pissing some money away. And, and as Bill, Bill O'Neill used to say to me, it's like, yeah, you know, it's the kind of market where, you know, you lose a million here, you lose a million there, pretty soon you're talking about real money. Um, which is all to say that a million dollars wasn't a lot of money to him. Of course, that made sense. Uh, but in any case, you know, that's, uh, th that's the way I'm looking at it. So maybe take the next week off. How about that? <clears throat> I'm still looking around for some things, see if there's anything that looks even reasonably decent. I know someone had mentioned this one to us a while ago, and that this thing's just blown up. I mean, that was looking pretty good for a little while, and then kaboom. Look at that breakdown. And this is a, kind of an interesting story as well. Um, one that's actually worked pretty well is uh, Everbridge. And this is a company that makes a system that allows uh, organizations to be in touch with their employees without having to rely on the phone systems or anything else. It's sort of an independent uh, system. And so during a, a major say, an earthquake or a terrorist attack or something, they can keep in touch with uh, their employees and other members of their organization. So this comes in handy for the government, for uh, police, fire, whatever, rescue. Uh, and you can see here you have a base breakout pulls into the 10-day line and holds. And this is a thinner stock, though. It trades 123,000 shares a day. But, you know, when you look around, this is what looks good, okay? What things that are really thin, the AGX... I got to admit, I was skeptical at first, but this thing's actually done well, but I would never buy it simply because it only trades a couple hundred thousand shares a day. But it's hard to sink your teeth into something like that, you know? So, somebody's saying, we hope to see you both at the VOSI member mixer. Oh, yeah, Dr. K, I forgot to run this by you, but I was thinking we should maybe have like a dinner event at uh, Cafe Del Rey or something in January, maybe, and, yeah, uh, sure. and have like a pre-fee type... Uh, uh, menu or something, and people pay a hundred bucks. Or I was, maybe we could make it into a, a seminar. We could charge everyone uh, seven thousand nine hundred ninety-five dollars uh, a head, and to have they could have a have dinner with two legends. How's that? Yeah, isn't that, uh, isn't that like the, yeah? That's a, that's the price point of the Neil organization, I think. Neil used to do that legend. one. <laughs> he used to have have dinner with a stock market. So now you could have a dinner with two legends. The only problem is we're legends in our own mind. So. A little bit different, but you know, if, if you can pay, if you want to pay seven thousand dollars, but no, seriously though, if yeah, we did something like that, we just want to make it relatively yeah, affordable. Really, Go ahead. It's a fun place. Uh, you know, we did your fiftieth there, and um, I think yeah, they got a big think, room in the back, the the uh, regatta room or whatever, and that'll hold about yeah. fifty people. So so yeah, we'll, we'll we'll talk about this later. All right. Sure. All right. Um, maybe hit the sushi bar next week and rap about it. Uh, Anyways, fair game. AIRG is having very tight closes on light volume. It is, actually. Uh, you know, I was looking at this the other day and thinking, I wonder if this thing... And, you know, this is another thing that flips me out about this market and what's so freaking bizarre about this market. It's like, here's a stock that, you know, for a week, nobody can get enough of this thing. You know, they're buying it, and it's, it's running up. It basically doubles in how many days? Six days or something like that? It goes from... 14 here, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 days to 28. It's so five days it doubles. And not even that. You could say from here, uh, four days it doubles. And and it's like people are buying it like there's no tomorrow, right? Like the, there's no shares left. Then they come out with secondary offering and they kill it. Now it's all the way back to where it started, just above 14. Volume is drawing up. I think uh, this is one of those ugly duckling formations. And by the way, uh, ugly duckling is not a label. It's just a, a term that I've come up with to sort of describe what happens in a QE market. When things look incredibly ugly, you'll often see things rally. And this gives rise to a whole bunch of ugly duckling types of long setups, which are undercut and rallies, big pullbacks to um, major areas of support where you see selling volume dry up. So, yeah, maybe this thing is setting up 
to pop higher. And I would say it's relatively low risk. Maybe you'd use the 14 level. Where are we trading at? 15, 10 right now. So the 14 level. Uh, from there, what is that? 7, 8 percent. I guess maybe that's percentage wise, that's a fair bit. But I, I would just mark it as like a point to the downside and then set your position, uh, you know, correspondingly. So that could, that's possible, you know. Uh, I like that, Barry. That's actually a good eye on that one. So I've been watching that. and But you want to see the selling. You don't know if it's drying up and getting ready to move lower. But isn't it odd? I mean, isn't it just odd that, that this thing just launches like nobody can buy enough of this thing, and then all of a sudden it just blows up? And you saw the same thing with Acacia. We saw the same thing with Twilio. I mean, a whole bunch of names have done that. And, uh, and it's a little bit ponderous. You see that in this market. You know, PI, and this is another one, by the way, that when it was like that, you know, people thought it was a high tide flag on the weekly chart down here. And, of course, we can see that it blew up. Let's, uh, what time did we get started? Like 10.05 or something like that? Um, yeah. So we're, uh, we're 9.05. Yeah. So anyways, they're looking at this, you know, is this a high tide flag? You know, it's not really that tight, but that's what happened to that. It, it actually had to set up again and break out. But, again, you know, it's a high tide flag to nowhere. And... Uh, but you could see how this could have been bought. You know, you have the setups in here. Uh, as it's setting up in here, you could have bought it on the pullback in here, and that would have worked. And that's probably the best way to go. Uh, let's see. Elos, thin. Yeah, that's extended, though. But that's an $8 stock. I'm not really going to mess with that. It trades 193,000 shares, and it's an $8 stock. That's the type of stock where... One of my broker buddies could get on the phone to their clients and start jacking the thing three bucks because it trades nothing. I wouldn't really touch that with a 10-foot pole, frankly. Anyways, come on. Give me something better than that. JT, is that another one of yours? Oh, you are a fiend for these stocks, aren't you? Someday we're going to have to send you to remedial, uh, uh, some sort of a remedial course for biotech uh, junkies. Anyways, um, Biotech rehab. There small, you go. Tesla. Here we go. Here's yeah. one. Tesla. You like Tesla? I think it's probably a short at the. It's running into the 40-week line, but it had a pocket pivot down here. We talked about it last week, and it's continued higher. Probably the the thing here is that the whole world shorted. So what they're going to have to do is is blow out all the shorts, and then it'll roll over. But right now it seems like they're rallying it on the basis that probably no, there's nobody left to sell it right now, and uh, everybody's shorted, so it's pushing. But the, bo the bottom fishing pocket pivot, one, two, three, four, five, nine days ago, you could have tested that, you know, using the 50-day line as your stop. It's only about 2 or 3% above it at that point, and now you've gotten close to the 20-week line. Uh, Hanukkah special, I like it. OCLR, Ocular, okay, Aclaro. This is uh, a cousin to FN and Light, okay? Similar sort of business. I think there's one other one like this. This is acting okay, but it's a cheap stock. But, you know, on the pullbacks, it's been, been acting okay. So it looks interesting on that basis. But kind of uh, eh, a little volatile on the weekly chart and not really setting up, and the group looks kind of weak. So I'm wondering if they're going to sell this thing off in the next three hours or if it's going to try and rally it. My theory was that they would sell off in the morning as everybody got out of the way ahead of the long weekend, and then it would just melt to the upside. But it looks like it's the other way around. Um, what else do we have on the, the list? Uh, Zorro, as I call it, Z. Look at how this thing uh, you know, runs up and then it gets whacked. And those are pretty good pretty, pretty good whacks, 10% off the peak. Uh so now here we are at the 20-day line. This is sort of sketchy to me. The base looks okay. You have nice big volume weeks here, supporting type action here, I guess, and uh, big vo upside volume uh, three weeks ago, and it's holding tight in here. So, you know, I don't know. Maybe that's viable in here, but it looks sketch sketchy. I saw the pocket pivot on Yelp the other day. Somebody put out a buy recommendation on it. But I, I actually looked at that as being shortable. Once it breaks out through the high, it looks good. You short it there, and it rolls back in. And that's what it looks like on a weekly chart. So I'm not really sure. you got some big volume here. Maybe it's trying to set up. But that was all on news from a uh, buy recommendation from a big brokerage. And so, uh, you know, I guess if it's pulling, you could try buying it. But I, I don't know. I'm a little skeptical here. This kind of looks a little head and shoulders-like, but... Not really conclusive, but I certainly wouldn't be buying it here. 
Um, I was looking at it though down here on Tuesday when that it had that little pocket pivot is actually right here and that looked interesting so anyways so as you can see it's kind of that sort of environment you know not a lot to do one way or the other so take it easy you know enjoy the holidays uh, relax we'll be back next week with the webinar maybe we'll review some of the year-end stuff maybe we'll have to figure out something like that maybe we'll do some sort of a year-end review type thing unless there's something really exciting happening which I just don't anticipate that occurring so I'm noticing Finis are moving lower <clears throat> that looks weak but the volumes light you know I think if you bust a 50 day that's gonna confirm as a short very interesting that they had a great earnings announcement and they just blasted this thing and that was a couple of weeks ago and the volume is huge so you gotta wonder what's what's up with that Anyways, that's all uh, I've got. You got anything to add, Dr. K? Yeah, quiet time. Uh, generally going this time of year uh, is is so. I mean, it's like the, all the politicians are uh, on holiday or something. So big market moves are, um, I think, very, very rare. And so far, this last week has been a snoozer, and I think this coming week will be as well. Yeah. <clears throat> so anyways, all right. Uh, so again, remember, our, our watch phrase for this week going into the end of the year is that uh, in the market, sometimes it's not what you do that matters so much as what you don't do. So maybe this is a time not to do much. Anyways, you guys, thanks for showing up. We'll catch you next week. Uh, have a Merry Christmas this weekend for those of you who celebrate a Happy Hanukkah, for those of you who celebrate that, and uh, Happy Kwanzaa. I think that is on Monday. So, And uh, we'll catch you guys after all that uh, holiday celebrating. So just don't overdo it. We don't want any hungover people. So catch you later. Take care. Hello, everyone.